Okay, it looks like we are live. It says Hangout is live. Um, so welcome to week seven. Uh, we're going to talk about algae uh, biofuels today, something I actually know about um, instead of all the other things that I just read about. But we're going to start uh, with a completely different topic. And that is uh, petroleum prices because somebody asked a question and this is one of my favorite uh, topics. Here it is right here. So here's the question. Petroleum prices are still dropping in the US. Any updates on this situation? And how do you see things playing out? Uh, so today, uh, when I just looked, they were $78.50 a barrel for WTI, West Texas Intermediate. So those of you who have taken this class and follow the, um, you know, the price of petroleum will know that in June it was at 100 bucks a barrel, and so that is now a 25 percent drop almost uh, over the last uh, essentially three months, July, August, or yeah, August, September, October. So in July it was still 100 bucks a barrel. Um, it, it's kind of amazing just to watch this. Um, so. It sort of seemed like it had bottomed out at about 82 bucks a barrel, and, and it was kind of bopping around there for the last couple of weeks. And then out of nowhere, the Saudis um, said a few days ago that they were going to drop the price of petroleum sold to the United States, that, you know, to the, to the Western countries, to Europe and the U.S., um, down to uh, 78 bucks a barrel and so boom there was the new floor it, it, it immediately dropped to that almost overnight um it's really fun to to read the papers and watch all the different commentaries uh, on this and and uh i i think there's two things that i find kind of interesting about this one is that the saudis uh, still have an enormous say in the price of oil. Uh, you know, for the last couple of years, people have been writing how, you know, they only produce 9 million barrels per day. Other countries are producing close to that. The U.S. is producing close to that. Russia produces close to that. OPEC is less important than it used to be. They can't get their act together. You know, pe people have a lot of opinions. But at the end of the day, uh, this, these last couple of months show you that the Saudis still have enormous clout in the oil industry. So that that's number one. And then number two, given that they have enormous clout, they're not the only reason that oil is down. You know, if the Saudis had come out and announced they were going to sell it for cheaper than that, but there wasn't a there wasn't a little bit of an oversupply of oil. Um, we produce about 92 million barrels a day. We burn about 91 million barrels per day. 1% doesn't seem like a lot of oversupply, but in the oil industry that's uh, that, that, that's a fair amount. Supply and demand is pretty tightly controlled between those. And the Saudis are not willing to cut there, so we're, we're going to stay at that until, until the price goes low enough that we stop producing it. So, um, so, so number one, this shows you that OPEC and the Saudis still have enormous clout. Number two, given that they do, and given, let, let's just give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they are the primary reason that, that the Saudis did just decide they were going to drop the price of oil from 100 bucks a barrel down to 80 bucks a barrel. Who is really, you know, being, being you know, hit by this? Who, who's impacted the most? First of all, the Soviet Union, enormously, because they're an enormous oil exporter. They don't export a lot of other stuff. It's sort of their major income in Russia. Um, so, so the, you know, the, the Russians are clearly impacted by this enormously. So are the Iranians. Uh, the Iranians also, even though their their oil export are down a lot because the world has got them under sanctions for their nuclear program, um, they still rely on this as as uh, external uh, you know funds into the country to pay for a lot of their social program. So they're also being hit pretty hard by this. And then the Venezuelans, uh, Venezuela has the second largest oil reserves in the world after the Saudis. They export a lot of it. Uh, their country has not been managed uh, very well lately. They, uh, you know, they took all their private oil companies, all their kind of companies in general, and, and turned them into, uh, you know, government-owned things, and that hadn't worked out so well for them. So they're also getting creamed by this. And, you know, 
in many ways, you can argue that it's to the Saudis' benefit. Uh, you know, Iranians are their, their sort of political competitors in the Middle East. So if they get pounded, Saudis probably like that. Uh, the Russians haven't been playing very nice with the rest of the world. So if they get pounded a little on that. That's probably good for them. And then, of course, it's a very good thing for the U.S. because the U.S. is not particularly happy right now with Russia and Iran. Um, and, you know, the Saudis still kind of get along with us pretty well. So uh, it, it's kind of pummeling their friends and, uh, I'm sorry, pum pummeling their enemies and, and sort of supporting their friends. So kind of good thing for them. And, and, and if they are controlling it, it's, it's pretty amazing. I, I don't think they fully are, but I think they still – carry enormous sway. But the other really interesting thing is, so clearly the frackers are getting pounded by this. Um, many people said that the, the, the price of, uh, you know, fracking, hydraulic fracturing to get oil out of the ground was probably 85 bucks a barrel. So at 100 bucks a barrel, they were making good money. When it dropped to 80, then there was a lot of kind of, oh, $80, you know, from the fracking you know, side of things said, oh, that's not enough to stop us. We're still going fully ahead. Although over the last month now, all of the little fracking companies have announced that they're cutting back uh, expenditures for next year. So clearly even at $80 a barrel, a lot of them were starting to cut back. Now at 78 bucks a barrel, ooh, this is not, this is not looking good for these guys. And some people have theorized that one of the things the Saudis want to get rid of is the U.S. fracking boom. That's 3 million barrels a day. If you get rid of that competition, so you get rid of the 3 million barrels per day that we're producing from fracking oil, and then suddenly the worldwide production goes from 92 or 93 million barrels a day down to 90 million barrels a day, and we're burning 91, now you're undersupplied, supply isn't meeting demand, price goes right back up. So you would think, well, okay, so what? So you cut the price back for a little while, and then the frackers come right back, but it turns out it doesn't work that way. Uh, once you stop uh, doing something, and especially if, it, if it, you stop doing it because you ran out of money, then people don't want to lend you money anymore. And all the frackers are relying, because they're not the big oil companies that are doing this, they're the little independent guys, and they very much rely on banks lending them money. They are 15% of the outstanding debt, uh, what, what's called high-risk debt in the United States right now, it's frackers. So. Uh, if these guys go belly up in the next six months, it's going to take years and years before they, they come back and start drilling again. So really interesting to, to kind of watch this going on and the economic dynamics. I think it's going to play out over the next three to six months. And, uh, and, and for me, it's just fascinating to watch this, right? I, I just, I mean, I, I think many of us were surprised at how fast fracking went up. And uh, boy, it's really surprising how fast it, it, it could crash. It just tells you the energy industry is really interesting. But another amazing thing that I've seen, and that is oil has only been, you know, above $20 a barrel since 2001. You know, kind of for the previous 100 years before that, it just never got above 20 bucks a barrel. There was a little spike in, in uh, the Arab oil embargo back in the 70s, but it kind of went up and came right back down. And, we knew why that was. And then this 400%, 500% increase over the last, you know, really since 2002 till now. So in the last 12 years, it went up fivefold. And, uh, and everybody yelled when it was going up, oh, you know, how can oil be this much? This is really bad. This is squeezing the economy. And, you know, certainly parts of that are true. It did squeeze the economy. But to me, the most amazing thing is now that the price has dropped 25%, it's amazing how many articles are being written on how bad this is for the United States. And I'm thinking to myself, well, okay, it's not very good for the frackers. I mean, if you're in North Dakota in the Bakken, or if you're down in Texas in the Eagleford, and your job is to extract oil by fracking, yeah, it's probably not very good for you. You might lose your job. But boy, every other part of the, the economy does much better when energy is cheap, and the whole rest of the world, it does better. It just goes to show you. People just don't like change. They, they would rather have high oil prices that don't change than high oil prices that go down. They'll find something that must be bad. So a uh, really interesting thing. We're going to keep watching it, and I suspect before this class is over, um, a, a lot more interesting things are going to come out of that. Okay, but enough on fracking and energy stuff. Let's talk about real things. Let's talk about, uh, you know, algae bioenergy, and let's go through some of these questions. So. Here's one right here. What is the life cycle of an algae? 
uh, do algae use up most of their stores of lipids in reproduction and then die? Okay, so um, almost all algae, um, they, they go through many different life cycles, but the average one when you're thinking about just inoculating them into a pond and growing them, that is vegetative division. So what they're doing is in the daytime, uh, you know, they're, they're during photosynthesis, they're mainly accumulating starch and a little bit of lipid. So, so the primary product of photosynthesis is sugars, and then those sugars quickly get converted into starch for storage. So they do that all during the day. Then at night, you take that starch, you degrade it back into sugar, you turn that sugar into energy, and you use that to grow. You can either divide or you can make uh, you can make other products with it. You can make proteins. You can make whatever. The green algae that I work on divides about when it's really humming along. It'll divide twice in a day, so it'll divide every twelve hours. But in general, let's just say algae divide once a day. Okay, so that's their that's their life cycle. You you have you have one algae. It photosynthesizes. It builds up some reserve, and then it uses that reserve to make a copy of itself, and it duplicates, and off it goes. Now, at some point that algae culture becomes so density, so dense, sorry, uh, the density gets so high that uh, they become light limited and therefore they stop growing, all right? Um, and so they're, they're restricted by growth, not because that algae couldn't divide again, but because they're now limited for some resource. And that resource is usually, at, at high density, it's light. Um, it could also be if they were out in the wild or if you weren't you know, feeding them uh, nitrogen and phosphate, they can also become limited on one of those key components, nitrogen or phosphate primarily. And then if they become limited on that, they also stop growing. Now, if you're talking about this for biofuels, they don't really die, right? They, they, they sort of hit density and then you harvest them in what's called late log phase before they go into the die-off phase, all right? So you would harvest them and then you're gonna go process them and get the oil out of them to recycle the nutrients. So that is the normal life cycle, the way we grow them uh, for energy production. But if you're talking about the normal life cycle of an algae out in the wild, what would happen is it's going through that normal cellular division as long as there's some nitrogen and phosphate around and as long as there's sunlight and they're not too high density. They're just growing along, happily dividing, doing photosynthesis in the day, dividing at night, making new copies of themselves, and, and off they go. At some point, they run out of one of those. So let, let's say they run out of nitrogen. When they run out of nitrogen, they sense this. They sense, uh-oh, we run out of nitrogen. Um, we're, we're, we, we better stop growing, and now we're going to do two things. We're either going we're, we're to go through sexual maturity so we can mate, or we're going to go into some, in, you know, we're going to insist in some way, cover ourselves with a thick, you know, coating, sink to the bottom and become a little spore, and either one of those processes are doing the same thing. Essentially what they've said is, times are getting tough, you know, we run out of stuff, and, and by the way, that can be, re, we run out of water too. So as water starts to evaporate and the salt goes higher, salt will also push them down this phase where they either go in and insist or they go in and mate and, and, and become diploid and then uh, build a little protective casing around themselves. And then they sink to the bottom and they sit there as what's called a spore, okay? And then when they're in a spore, they're sort of in a, in a frozen state. Uh, they're not doing photosynthesis anymore. They're not dividing. They're not growing. They're just sitting there. And what they're doing is they're just sitting and waiting for times to get better. And better time could mean uh, nutrients show up again, more nitrogen and phosphate flows into the little lake that I'm in. Ah, I sense that more phosphates here come out of that, that uh, frozen state and start dividing again. Or it could be that, uh, you know, rain comes down, salt dilutes out again, and off I get growing again. So, that you know, that they, they go through a life cycle. Um, depending upon the environmental conditions. Under envir ideal environmental conditions, they, they just keep on asexually dividing. Uh, under stressful times, they either sexually mate or insist in, and, uh, and go off and wait for a, for a better day to show up, okay? So, and, and obviously, by the way, this whole time there, you, you don't live forever. You divide, uh, you make multiple copies of yourself. So you have mother, mothers and what they call daughters, and you'll do that multiple times. Then obviously at some time after you've divided, I think it's about eight times in, in the green algae we work on, Clamidomonas, then you do die and fall to the bottom. So inside of a pond, there are always plenty of dead algae in there. But those dead algae are still loaded with lipids. In general, they, they sort of 
float down to the bottom and then maybe in, in the wild bacteria come and eat them or even in, in a big algae pond bacteria come and eat them. So it's not that they live forever. They, they do eventually die, but it, they don't die because they use up all of their uh, starch or uh, lipid reserves. Uh, you know, they, 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 they die just because their, their time's up, programmed cell death. Okay. Okay. Could you compare the pros and cons of saline versus freshwater algae? So, um, that that one is really easy if um, if you want to say that fresh water is a limited resource. So the 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 first you know biggest pro for saline uh, algae is that there's a lot a lot salt water on the planet, and it's not just the stuff in the oceans. By the way, yes, there's a whole lot of um, salt water in the oceans. Seventy percent of the planet is covered by it. But believe it or not, there are lots of saline and what we would call brackish aquifers. Uh, everywhere around the world. So this is water that is underground that is not low enough salt concentration to be used either for human or animal consumption, you know, just to drink, or used to grow uh, traditional crops, corn, soybean, wheat, etc., the, the, the non-salt tolerant crops. So there's lots of that saline water. So pro number one is if I have an algae, um, a, a marine algae species or, or a saltwater tolerant, saline tolerant uh, algae, I grow it in that, okay? But there's lots of places in the world where fresh water is not really limited. Uh, you know, every lake, every, uh, you know, stream running around, uh, you know, the United States, the Amazon, you name it, every place else. Th those are freshwater algae that grow in there. So in terms of productivity, uh, you have freshwater algae that are very productive and you have saltwater algae that are very productive. So there, there's no benefit per se in the productivity of photosynthesis. It works good in either one of those, okay? Um, so, so, so that's not a particular advantage, all right? Or disadvantage, that, 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 that's kind of neutral. So it's just a matter of what is the most water around. Now there is one disadvantage in saltwater production, and that's that saltwater is much more corrosive than freshwater. Um, anybody who has ever had a boat uh, you know, on the ocean knows that you got to be washing that guy all the time because that, that salt water splashes on things just really increases the rate of degradation, especially of metal products. So, uh, so there is that disadvantage. When you're in a salt water condition, uh, you either have to have super high uh, quality stainless steel to keep it from corroding by the salt water or stuff is going to corrode quicker. And that's kind of, oh, believe it or not, yeah, that, that, that's also true in you know, any machine that's got little gears, even if it was a plastic machine, you know, plastic gears that didn't uh, necessarily corrode with the salt water, you'll still get any places where those are exposed to the air, the salt water splashes up on them, only the water evaporates away, salt crystals come in there, and then those salt crystals act just like sandpaper and just grind everything up. So there is a bit of disadvantage on the, you know, the mechanical process side of things to be in salt water. All right, but the second part of the question says, when near the coast, is there a disadvantage to only using saline algae varieties and saline ponds? So not in productivity, uh, you know, put fertilizer in them, they both use the same nitrogen and phosphate, that doesn't matter, freshwater, saltwater, that both goes into it. The algae that grow in them, you get green algae that grow in saltwater, you get, uh, you know, diatoms that grow in freshwater, so there are many similar species in both of those. So like I say, the, the biggest disadvantage is that salt water is a little corrosive. The biggest advantage is there's a lot more salt water on this planet than there is fresh water. And then the last part of it, it says, if so, meaning there's an advantage with saline, are diatoms the best option? Diatoms are a good option. They grow really quick. They're brown algae, by the way. They're not green, so they have slightly different chlorophylls in them. Chlorophyll C instead of chlorophyll. Uh, they're dominated by chlorophyll C, which is a more brown colored chlorophyll rather than chlorophyll A which is, is the bright green color that you're used to seeing. They have it, you know, diatoms have chlorophyll A, they just have a lot more chlorophyll C and other pigments that make them brown. Um, but other than that, they, they, they do photosynthesis very similar. Uh, efficiency is very similar. Uh, some diatoms accumulate naturally very high levels of lipid. People like them a lot. Uh, fast growing, genomes are sequenced. We can do a lot of stuff with them. A lot, you can do a lot of cool things with diatom. Uh, the one downside that, that some of the big algae companies have not liked about them is uh, diatoms cover themselves uh, with a silicon shell, 
Um, I'm sure you guys have seen some beautiful pictures and Mark Hildebrand's doc had some beautiful pictures of those, uh, of, of the little shells that uh, cover these things. Some of really intricate, really nice patterns. Uh, Mark and other people think about doing sort of nano structures out of that, you know, like could we genetically program these guys to make little circuits or make even cooler little things, right? Um, so, so, so they kind of do cool things with that, but that's a disadvantage because it's an inert packaging. Um, so, so that's not carbon-based, it's silicon-based, and that means you can't burn it. And uh, that means once you harvest a diatom and extract the lipid and the protein out of it, both of which are valuable, you're still left with a fair amount of uh, silicon that you got to do something with. Uh, you can throw it back into the ponds, you, you can discard it or whatever, but you do have to physically do something with it. And so there is that cost of actually having to, uh, to either dispose of it or find some other use for it. Right now, people haven't come up with a clever, you know, sort of economic use for that. There is something called diatomaceous earth, uh, which is simply old diatoms that, that settle down in shallow oceans and all of their lipids and proteins got eaten by bacteria. And so the only thing left are, are the little, are, are the shells. And they actually use that as sieves, as filters. So diatomaceous earth, if you pass water, water goes right through it because there are little tiny holes in those things. And then any particle will get trapped in that. Uh, so there are some some sort of cool things you can do with it, but not super high value. That that's kind of a very low low value product. So that's the only reason that I think that some oil companies, some energy algae energy companies, have sort of sh shied away from diatoms. You also have a requirement, obviously, that you have to have silicon in the media. Uh, if you're growing them in salt water, obviously there's a lot of silica around. Even in fresh water, there's a fair amount of silica around. Throw some sand in, and and some silica is in the water. But it is an additional nutrient that you have to add. But not on productivity. On productivity, they're brown algae, green algae. They're, they're, they're both great, and they both make really nice lipids. They do make some really interesting secondary metabolites uh, that are very different in the brown algae compared to the green algae. So there, there's, there's sort of lots of interest in looking at these things just for the diversity and the genes you can get out of them. Okay. So Bami says, why is the cost of algae production so high? It will be very useful if Dr. Mayfield can elaborate on different cost elements and where with scale of economy or other breakthroughs, this price may come down with commercialization. Okay, so that's a great question. So uh, when we started working on algae bioenergy, biofuels, about uh, seven years ago, the best estimates then were that the cost of oil from algae was something around $28, $30 a gallon. So really expensive. Okay, 10 times more than what it is now. Over the last seven years, we've got that price down to some people say seven bucks a gallon now, maybe eight bucks a gallon, something in there. Um, the reason there was that big drop so quick was really two things. One, we went out and did bioprospecting and we identified uh, a bunch of strains of algae that are more productive. So we have about twice the productivity now we do in a pond that we did seven years ago. So twice the productivity keep ponds, keep everything else, all your other input costs the same, you've already cut the price in half, okay? But we cut the price fivefold, so how do we cut it fivefold? Well, so that was number one. Number two, we got crop protection to work better, so that was a benefit. Now we can run algae ponds, you know, 10, 11 months in a row, you know, 12 months in a row without having crashes, so that certainly helped. Another really important aspect was when we first started on these, the way algae is harvested for nutraceutical use is either, if it's cyanobacteria, you do it by filtration. If it's one of the green algae, you do it by settling or centrifugation, and those are expensive processes. But what Sapphire Energy and a couple of the other groups found out was that we could use something called dissolved air flotation. Uh, that's used in water treatment plants and sewage treatment plants. Very inexpensive. That turned out to work really well only added a couple pennies per gallon, that dropped the price a lot. Once you got rid of centrifugation <coughs> and went to dissolved air flotation, that dropped the price down. Then a really important one came along and that was hydrothermal liquefaction, HTL process, okay? That was a really major breakthrough because that one, prior to that, people imagined that what they had to do was harvest the algae, dry all the water out of it, and then do a hexane extraction to get the neutral lipids out of it. And if you go through that drying process, that's really energy intensive, and energy intensive means expensive, okay? Number two, once you dry an algae out and do a hexane extraction, 
the only part of the lipid you're getting out are what's called neutral lipids. So you don't pull out the photosynthetic lipids or any of the polar lipids. So that is a long chain uh, fatty acid that has a sugar or a phosphate or a sulfur, something charged on the end of it. So that charged one, then it's not neutral. It's got a charge on it anymore. If you're just straight triisoglyceride or just straight fatty acid, you're generally what's called a neutral lipid. You don't have a charge on it. Hexane extracts at those really well, but it left in the polar one. So you were leaving in two thirds of your energy. Once we found out about hydrothermal liquefaction, that, that strips the polar heads off that, releases the, the fatty acids, releases the, the dye and, and triglycerides, breaks them down into, into single fatty acids. So those were the really big breakthroughs and that got the price down to seven or eight dollars a gallon. And that's probably where we are today. So what are the elements going forward that we need to do? There's really two. One of them is the ponds, what's called the Noswell pond. And, and we'll talk about that because there's a question about it in the middle. That's the paddle wheel ponds. That is the plastic lined paddle wheel ponds that you've seen in the videos that we've shown. That, that's like our little pond here at UCSD. That's all the ponds that are used worldwide for outdoor production of cyanobacteria or hematococcus or any of the algae they're grown for nutraceuticals, okay? Those are expensive. Those are expensive for two reasons. One, the plastic lining is expensive, and two, those paddle wheels are expensive. So we have to make improvements on the design to get that cost down. That's called the CapEx cost, all right? The cost of actually building the ponds, lining it with plastic, putting in that big metal paddle wheel. We got to get that down. Right now, the best guess that I've seen on those things is we're about $8,000 an acre, and we need to get that price down $4,000 an acre, and it would be better if we had it down to $2,000 an acre. You can get to $2,000 an acre if you do a dirt-lined pond. And in some ways, people think, well, how can you have a dirt-lined pond? All the water will just flow right out of it. But that turns out not to be true. Uh, we have 375 million acres worldwide of rice paddies, and those are dirt lined, and the water doesn't instantly run out of those. So they have to be clay lined, or they have to be lined with some hygroscopic salt. Uh, but if you do that, then the water doesn't run out of them. And we do that here in the United States when we build, uh, you know, uh, these artificial lakes. So in the artificial lakes, when you make one of those, you you put a lining on the bottom that is not plastic but it's some chemical. It can either be clay, it could be salt, or it could just be some soil that, uh, that will seal and not let water run out of it. So you can get the price of those things down, and there are several designs uh, that people have now proposed, okay? You also have to get the energy inputs down. That's the paddle wheel, and people have thought about, can we have wind agitated ponds? Can we have gravity-fed ponds? And I've seen many designs for this at large scale. One, one of the kind of really clever ones are these big, long uh, serpentine ponds where you just have a very slight, uh, you know, slope downward, one or two percent, just enough to have the water run, but not too fast. And then you make the pond, it kind of, it kind of winds back and forth as it slowly drops in elevation. And, uh, and if you do that, then the energy input, because it's mainly gravity that's mixing these ponds, now becomes much less. So that's all part of the CapEx and the energy in. And I think doing that, we can probably cut that price in half again. So that gets us down to about four bucks a gallon. That's still not competitive with fossil fuel, because even though you pay four bucks a gallon, now less, but even though we were paying four bucks a gallon for gasoline, remember, that's the price of gasoline after it's refined, after it's transported to the gas station, after profit is put in it, all those other things, okay? 42 gallons in a barrel of oil, and so even at 100 bucks a barrel, that's only $2.50 a gallon. So the real number you're aiming for is something like that, around two, 225 a gallon, 250 a gallon tops uh, that we can afford to pay for it. So. Uh, improvements in CapEx and pond design and energy use gets us down to $4 a gallon. Now we just, we, we just need to double our productivity. I know just, uh, but believe it or not, it's not that much, right? Uh, right now, uh, 20, 25 grams per meter squared per day. Theoretical tops out about 100. So if we can get up there to that 40 to 50 grams per meter squared per day, uh, and some people have, uh, certainly in small test ponds, we've got to that. 
If we can get to that level and do that year round, bang, then we're down to, to two bucks a gallon. But that's still a, a ways off. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with everyone. That, that, that's a tough number to hit. Um, that's going to take some pretty clever research. That's going to take some more uh, strain optimization, maybe even some more bioprospecting to find better guys, right? Then we're going to have to get to that. One of the other ideas that has been pitched recently is if we could just keep our productivity the same, which is about 22, 25 grams per meter squared per day, but drop the cost of labor by having people work on these ponds much less. So in other words, sort of like a rice paddy. You just plant it, and then you don't do a whole lot until it's time to harvest it, right? Right now, we sort of, you know, we put the algae in, and then every week, we, you know, we take half the water out and harvest it and then replace the media and the water back into it. That's maximum productivity, but that might not be maximum economic benefit. It might be we could accept lower yields if we had much, much less lower inputs. So in other words, put algae into a pond and rather than harvest it every week, maybe we, won't, we only harvest it once a month, right? And people are thinking about different ways that we could achieve that. And uh, so opportunities along all these things, but we're probably still four times, maybe three times too expensive. And then the other thing is the price of fossil fuel could go up. The price of fossil fuel goes up to 120, 140 bucks a barrel. Well, now you are at 350 or $4 a gallon uh, for crude oil, and, and that, that also helps drive the economics. And then the last thing is a carbon tax, right? Uh, many people think that the price of uh, carbon, what it actually costs the economy to spew that stuff out, is something around 50 or $60 a ton. And, and if you do that, that, that also adds, uh, you know, considerable amount. I mean, that, that 60 bucks a ton for the carbon, if you got that paid to the algae companies to capture that, 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 that would go a long way to, to improving their economic picture. Okay? All right. Here's another one from Javier C. There are many business opportunities to deploy renewable projects in Venezuela. How UC San Diego could help? Well, so what is UC San Diego? We, we don't build big production facilities. We do a lot of the research, especially the high-end molecular research, to look at strain development, uh, to, to look at life cycle analysis, uh, to look at growth conditions, uh, you, you know, even a little bit on pond design. So there, there, are, there are lots of groups here at UC San Diego. There are people who work on solar forecasting. There are people who work in photovoltaics. There are people who work on battery storage. There are people who work on wind. Most of these are, are sort of very high-end design and less sort of practical, you know, deploying technologies into the field right now. But some of our undergrads, I just got a really nice email from one of our undergrads who went down and put low-energy cook stoves uh, down in, uh, in Central America. And... Uh, they took a group of UCSD students down there and, and, and built some of these for, for some of the communities down there. Very nice, right? Uh, much less, uh, you know, uh, wood has to be burned in these things. And then importantly, when the wood is burned, rather than that soot and carbon monoxide going into the kitchen uh, where the people are cooking, uh, you know, the, the heat stays in there in the cooking part. And, and they, these exhausts back out of the house. And that, that, that's an enormous benefit uh, for the people who have to do the cooking. And, and in many parts of the world, women spend and girls spend many parts of the day sitting over a, a, a wood-fired stove, breathing in that smoke. And, you know, okay, maybe we like to sit around a campfire and stuff, but if you have to do that every day, that's actually very unhealthful. So um, where, where I think we can help is uh, certainly we'd love to get some of our students involved down there to, to do some really hands-on projects. We have something, we have students here who participate in something called Engineers Without Borders uh, who try to do these things. And then, of course, we would love to help, you know, and, and some of our scientists are very good about traveling around the world and, and talking to governments and municipalities and states who want to put in large solar project or large wind projects, right? And, uh, and then, of course, you know, on, on, on the algae side, uh, we'd love to hear from some of you guys if you want some help getting, getting you know, sort of algae technology grown up down there. Okay? 
All right, here's one from Mitchell Ryan. He always sends a good question in. Can diatomaceous earth be melted down into glass? Probably so. I actually, I actually don't know what the difference between sand and diatomaceous earth is, but I, but I'm betting that sand, which can be melted down into glass, uh, is probably even cheaper than diatomaceous earth. But I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe it gets you something slightly different. So so there are certainly uh, applications for for everything, um, but but in general. You know, there, there's a lot of inputs to make glass. I think what would be more cool is if uh, Mark Hildebrand and some of the diatom guys could engineer their algae to make some pretty cool little, you know, little nano machines there or parts of nano machines. Then I think you could make super high value, you know, diatomaceous earth, essentially. You, you would make diatom shells that... Uh, that, that, that could have enormous ap applications in nanotechnology. Okay, I have questions about providing CO2 in open ponds. So uh, let me start by saying, before I even read that question, providing CO2 to open ponds, believe it or not, right now is one of the most expensive inputs because we have to pay for our CO2. How is CO2 being provided? So you can get CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, so if you simply mix the pond and all of the guys who grow nutraceuticals or most of the guys who grow nutraceuticals and anyone who grows in a natural setting, they are not providing CO2 to their ponds. They're just getting CO2 out of the atmosphere. But if you want to have these really highly productive ponds, then you do that by pumping CO2 into it. And that CO2 can come, a little bit comes from the atmosphere, but then you can also supplement it uh, from concentrated CO2. The way Sapphire actually does theirs right now is they have a collaboration with Lindy Gas. Lindy Gas is one of the biggest, uh, you know, gas suppliers in the world. You know, they bring helium and CO2 and oxygen and you name it. If it's a gas, they, they, they sell it and, and transport it around the, the planet. And uh, so they have a collaboration with Lindy right now to look at CO2 to get it into their ponds, but they pay for it. Sapphire actually buys that CO2. Now, there's, there's also a very big use of CO2 in this country called enhanced oil recovery. And, and what is enhanced oil recovery? Enhanced oil recovery is you take CO2 and under very high pressure, that CO2 will become a liquid. And then you pump that liquid CO2 underground and liquid CO2 is really good about dissolving hydrocarbons. So it will melt any, any oil that's sort of stuck on rocks or, uh, you know, tight oil, as they call it. Or suppose you, you, you've got an oil field and you've pumped oil out of it and the flow has gone down. If you pump liquid CO2 into there, you will get that oil flowing again. So that's enhanced oil recovery. And in those places, where does that CO2 come from? Believe it or not, there are big sources of CO2 underground, right? Because, you know, along with methane and other hydrocarbons, you also get CO2. Um, and you can also capture that from refineries. Uh, you can capture it from breweries. You can get it from lots of places. Um, and so there's a pipeline that kind of runs all over Texas and sort of the southwestern United States of CO2 uh, that is used specifically for enhanced oil recovery. That CO2 works perfectly good if you pump it into ponds. And that CO2, by the way, is much cheap, much cheaper be because you're near a pipeline. And pipelines are way cheaper than, than bringing things in by truck. Um, so that, that's, that's how it comes now. In the future, we imagine that CO2 that is put out from either methane or coal-fired power plants will be captured, you know, as it's coming out of the smokestack. And then you take that CO2 and pump it into a pond. That is what uh, is referred to as beneficial uh, reuse of CO2. Um, there's sort of two schools of thought. on what we do with CO2 that comes out of a point source like that. One is sequestration. So if you talk to people in the coal industry and the big spiel that you hear about clean coal, clean coal, what is clean coal? Clean coal means you capture the CO2 coming out of the smokestack from a CO2 fired electrical plant and then sequester that CO2 underground. And, uh, and, and believe it or not, there's an enormous research project paid for by the Department of Energy to do just that. But the algae guys have argued, well, don't stick that CO2 underground. Uh, you know, it's number one, it's expensive to do that, uh, 70 or $80 a ton to, to pump it deep underground. And two, 
at best that's a temporary storage because it's a gas. So if you pump it underground, sooner or later it's going to come back up. So I don't know that you really sequestered it or not. Oil is sequestered because it's a hydrocarbon. It's not a gas, so it's like a, you know, it, it, it's a liquid, but it's like a lake, right? You get it underground. It doesn't spontaneously pop up and, and evaporate away, but CO2 is a gas. One little crack where you pump it underground, and, and up it comes and back out into the atmosphere. So many people have argued that CO2 sequestration is expensive. It's certainly not guaranteed to last, temporary at the best. Why not beneficially reuse it? Why not take that CO2, pump it into an algae pond, let that CO2 drive productivity of the algae, let it be captured uh, into some reusable and economically viable form of chemical energy. Fuels would be one, uh, nutraceuticals, animal feed, you name it, right? So that's ben beneficial re reuse. Um, the second part of the question says, uh, is it supplied by pumping to the pond? Yes, or by the addition of some chemical such as bicarbonate? No, it's only done as pumping. CO2 is by far the cheapest source. Once you put it into a bicarbonate, that's an expensive process to do that. And uh, yeah, so the cheapest way is just CO2 gas, although generally compressed down to a liquid to, to ship it around. Okay. I'll try to go through these questions a little quicker so we get through all of them today. In your opinion, are Oswell Raceway ponds the only real economic option for algae biofuel production at a large scale? No, that certainly not. Um, Oswald, a uh, very clever guy, a faculty member at UC Berkeley, and 40 years ago, he went and built those raceway ponds, big circular oval tracks with a paddle wheel on one end to mix the algae, and, and those were very productive. Uh, used all over the world. Uh, we have them here on campus. Uh, Sapphire, that's what their ponds are. Earthrise, Cyanotech, you name it. You used all over the world and they work fine. But are they the only way? No. They still use a huge amount of energy and they're, they're certainly not perfect. And we have better ways to design things because over the, fact, over the last 50 years, we've come up with better, clever ideas. Okay? So I think, uh, you know, pond design is still something that uh, will progress for the next many years, uh, not only for the biofuels arena, but for nutraceuticals and for everything else that we're going to grow algae at large scale. Okay. Is starting the growth in a closed bioreactor essential to success in open ponds? Right now, yes, it is. So you have to start with a pretty clean culture, right? If that culture is already heterogeneous when you are at a small scale and you put it out in an open pond, then you're kind of doomed, right? It's, if, if you want to end up with uh, you know, most of your pond being the algae you put into it, you have to have a pretty clean inoculum when you go in. So right now, every pond system that I know on the planet, save a couple of natural ones that have an, that have an extreme uh, environment. Okay, hold on, I lost my question here. There we go. Except for the ones that, that grow in an extreme environment, like the uh, cyanobacterias, like spirulina, um, in, in, in that case, they grow in an extreme environment and not much competes with them, so you sort of get away with it. But I, I think it is essential, okay? So there's lots of room for design of small-scale uh, closed systems uh, in biofuel use, but those will use, be used in what's called the, the inoculation train. Um, I, I don't think there's, there's any opportunity to go to really large-scale uh, bioreactors for fuel use. They're just too expensive. That capex is too high, right? Okay, here's our next question. How is the temperature controlled in closed bioreactors? So you do absolutely have to control the temperature in closed bioreactors. There's kind of two ways to do that. One is evaporation, which means you have a closed bioreactor and you just mist uh, water onto the surface of that thing. And then the evaporation uh, of that water off the surface you know, the tubes or the, the glass sheets, whatever your bioreactor is, the evaporation off that transfers cool uh, into it. The second way is you can actually put cold fingers, right? You, you have part of the loop uh, as you're pumping that around, goes through a process where the temperature is brought back down. Cooling is very expensive. Uh, this is one of the things, you know, I, I hear people say this all the time. Oh, closed bioreactors will be better for biofuels because they don't get contaminated. 
and because there's there won't be any water loss from evaporation. So it's true that there's no or lower evaporation from the liquid inside the bioreactor, but evaporation is doing one really important thing in an open system, keeping it cool. So when you are in an open raceway, all of that evaporation is a cooling process. It keeps that algae from overheating. When you are in an enclosed bioreactor, if you are not misting something on the surface to evaporate off, then that system is going to overheat and kill your algae immediately. Uh, the minute you lose cooling and you are outside in the summer, your algae is dead less than you know a few hours, and it is dead as can be. So it's, it's not true that big uh, closed systems do not use water. They do. Evaporation is the cheapest way to cool it, much, much cheaper than using any other form of energy to cool it. So that's the way you cool those big things, and that means there is evaporation. How serious of an issue is pest in the closed system? It's still a big issue. It's certainly less than an open system, because in an open system, any path or pathogen can just you know, blow in on the wind. Uh, so it's less than that, but the disadvantage is that, that in an enclosed system, when you get an infection, you're in an enclosed system. Everybody's in really tight quarters, so those infections tend to spread pretty quick. So still an issue, less than in open systems, but it's something you got to worry about. All of our closed systems here, especially the ones we're trying to keep sterile, you know, we lose 10 or 20 percent of them. You know, even though we treat them all the same and try to very carefully make sure they don't get contaminated, 10 percent of the time, sometimes 20 percent of the time, they get contaminated. It's kind of worse in the summer. It's hot and there's lots more bugs kind of blowing around and then, then we tend to lose them even more, but it's a problem, even in a closed system. Okay, next question. Are the greenhouse gas soot particles emissions increased or decreased by the presence of pesticides and algae fuels? Hmm. So there's very little, in, if you really want to go to large scale in algae, you don't get to use much pesticides. You're using them, um, even the fungicides that, that are occasionally used, those are used down in the parts, one part per million, sometimes even lower than one part per million. By the time you've gone through hydrothermal liquefaction, those things are not pesticides anymore. So very little, very little pesticides are put in them, and I would say none of that ends up in the fuels. Can the byproducts from algae treated with pesticides still be used for food? Example, omega-3. Well, that would completely depend upon the pesticide put in and whether it's approved for use on foods. So there are a bunch of pesticides. Now, there's a bunch of organic. Uh, pesticides, you know, that come from natural na natural systems that are allowed to be used. Uh, for example, a very famous one is called uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacteria. It grows on uh, on lots of different plants, uh, and you spray that one. You know, it's a wild type bacteria, and you spray it on your plants. And any Lepidopteran larva that comes along and eats the plant that has uh, the Bt bug on it. What the BT bug is, it makes a little protein, which is unfortunately called a uh, crytoxin. Uh, it's not toxic. It's an anti-feeding peptide. So the bacteria comes along, eats a leaf that has that bacteria growing in it. Uh, the, the protein inside the bacteria, uh, the cry protein inside the bacteria, uh, hits a little receptor on the insect's uh, gut and tells the insect that it's full. You're full, stop eating. And uh, so the insect stops eating. And when you stop eating, after a little while, you run out of energy, so you fall off the plant. So people looked at it and they said, oh, look, if we spray it with this stuff, you know, within a couple of days, the insects fall off. It must be toxic to them, but it's actually not toxic to them at all. It just, it just stops eating. And when, when you don't eat, you die. Um, so that's a completely, uh, you know, natural product. It's, it's out in the environment all the time. Anybody who buys lettuce or broccoli or anything else, doesn't matter if the farmer sprays it on or not. There's bacteria in there, and you're getting that stuff. So that one absolutely safe, and it's approved. And you can, I think you can spray it on the day before you harvest produce and sell it. Others of them are a little nastier, especially some of the ones they they spray on fruit and uh, and vegetables, on tomatoes and the likes, to kill the uh, the worms that eat those things. Some of those can be pretty bad, but most of the really bad ones tend to react. Uh, it means they get oxidized pretty quick. 
And uh, so some of those, it's two or three days uh, from when you spray them to when you can use it. One of, one of the kind of, you know, things that always shocks me is, uh, you know, organic farming. Uh, the people are under the impression that organic farmers don't use pesticides. Organic farmers absolutely use pesticides. They just use organic pesticides. They use pesticides that are derived from nature. All of nature spends most of its time fighting with each other. Uh, you know, there are wasps out there that sting, uh, that, 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 you know, uh, come and plant their eggs on caterpillars' backs. Uh, there are bacteria that secrete little toxins to defeat the bacteria around them. The real world is a violent, tough place where it's eat or be eaten. And all of those things are perfectly natural. They're, they're in nature all the time. And you eat them all the time. You know, whether you harvest uh, your vegetables from, you, you know, your garden here or whether they're grown for you in the Salinas Valley or Imperial Valley or whatever, there are plenty of bacteria on those, right? You're, and your gut is loaded with bacteria. And so those are natural products. So organic farming has nothing to do with, with we don't use pesticides. That what they don't use and what they're not allowed to use are chemical pesticides. Now, in the 50s and 60s, you know, better living through chemistry, we synthesized a bunch of artificial, kind of nasty little chemicals. The famous one when I was a kid was called DDT. DDT was uh, invented in World War II to get rid of insects uh, that show up in close quarters. So uh, it was in every uh, flea powder. Uh, you know, it got rid of bed bugs, it got rid of mosquitoes, it pretty much killed every insect. Uh, we produced a huge amount of that in the 50s and 60s. Oh, it was the greatest thing ever. You just threw it everywhere. The problem was that was not a natural product, okay? That was a completely artificial chemical, and that persisted in the environment, so that didn't break down very quick. Over time, that started to accumulate in the environment, and it had very bad effects, and we figured this out, and so we banned it in, in the 70s. Uh, you know, in the late 70s, when I was in college, um, that stuff had just been banned. But believe it or not, I had a chemistry lab, a synthetic organic chemistry lab, and so we made DDT in the lab because it was, you know, five years before had been a very big chemical in the chemistry in, in, in the chemical industry. wasn't hard to make. You know, we made it. We checked it. We saw that we, we showed that we made the right thing. We never did anything with it, but you know, it was just a teaching thing. Uh, but so we've gotten rid of those, most of those things. So, again, specific answer to your question, can byproducts from algae treated with pesticides still be used for food? Yes, if that pesticide is accepted for food use. As, or same with beauty projects. And the, and the legislation on, on pesticide use in algae, there's very little right now. Um, you get what you call a use permit. So pesticides are regulated to use on a specific crop. So, for example, if I'm a farmer and I want to spray onto my cotton some pesticide, I get a use, uh, it's called the label, and on the label it will tell me, you can spray this on cotton at X pounds per acre or X mils per acre. But if I'm in corn, that's different, okay? I don't get to use that, that, the same label for, uh, you know, alfalfa or for whatever, you know, on, on corn, or sorry, on cotton that I do on corn. I have to go and use what's, what's regulated for corn. So because people haven't requested these things in algae yet, there are not labels for algae. So what you do is you get a uh, research uh, permit. So you, you go to the USDA and you say, hey, I want to try this pesticide, which is used in broccoli or used in rice, and I want to test it on algae. And if in rice patties it's used at three parts per million, just to be safe, I want to use it at a part per million in algae. And, and, and the USDA can give you a permit, or the state can give you a permit and say, yeah, go ahead and give it a try and let's see how it works. Now, after we've done that for several years and it seems to be safe and there's no adverse consequences, then that'll be put on the label. And so whatever that pesticide is, we'll say you can use this on rice at three parts per million and you can use it on algae right now. But right now, there are none. There's, there's no place you can go and have a label that tells you what you can use in algae, okay? But th 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 that'll come over time. Okay, what about controlling pH in open ponds? How can we control and what will it affect? So uh, pH has an enormous effect, and this is almost exclusively controlled by pumping CO2 into the pond. Obviously, when you pump CO2 into the pond, 
uh, you know, that, that, that pulls the hydrogen uh, off water, right? H2CO3 uh, is, is what it becomes when you pump it into there. And uh, so that acidifies uh, the mix. And uh, so as your CO2 gets used up, pH rises, you check that with your pH, you pump in CO2 and push it back down. So controlled almost exclusively by CO2. You can put fancy buffers in there, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, buffers do what they do. They, 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 they keep the pH more constant, right? But in general right now, controlled by how much CO2 we put into it. Uh, in green microalgae, it's done absolutely by measuring the pH and pumping CO2. In fact, that's how we know when to add CO2 or not add CO2, sim simply based on the pH. Do you know if anyone is looking into bioengineering algae to float to the surface instead of sinking to the bottom when they die? And uh, so they can be skinned off the surface. That's a great one. Uh, many people have thought about this. You know, I've, I've heard a couple people propose it. Oh, wouldn't that be great if, if algae floated to the top, especially when they died, right? That would be the absolute best, right? Like you're getting to the end of your life cycle and then you turn on some gene, put in, I don't know, a little bubble of air or something and up you float. So there are definitely algae that float and there are algae that sink and there are algae that neutral, that are neutral buoyancy. And we're starting to understand those a, a little better and how they work. And uh, great question, and I have yet to see anybody come up with a really clever uh, solution for that, meaning I, I've yet to see a gene that turns on that causes the algae to float. But, but Joel, that's a good one for you to work on, and uh, you should go to grad school and do it. I, I think that'll be enormously valuable for the community. Okay, we only got a couple minutes left, but we only have a couple questions left. What is the greenest and most environmental friendly solution for algae's pest control? knowing that biodiversity is higher in tropical regions. Biodiversity is the best one. If you have five different algae growing in there, uh, pests and pathogens tend to be very species specific. So if you have five algae growing and a, a pest or pathogen gets in and kills one of them, the other four guys keep growing just fine. And uh, generally once that one guy loses out, you don't even lose anything in the overall biomass because they all grow. 20% faster because of less competition. Okay, more, uh, moreover, if we put the climate back on track, biodiversity will bloom everywhere. Yeah, probably not by putting the climate back on track, probably if we stop, you know, strip mining and chopping everything down, that will put the, you know, that, that will put biodiversity back on track. One of the things that, that is really important for people to understand, the more efficient we get at producing our food means the smaller amount of land we can use to produce our food. That puts more land back into being the native grasslands and the tropical forest and the rest of the stuff it was. So I hear people say all the time, oh, we need to go back. We need to do organic farming and we need to get away from these big factory farmings. The problem with that idea is, although it's good for you as an individual, and I have my wife grows a great garden in the, the backyard, the more efficient we are, there are 7 billion people on this planet. Every person can't have a one-acre little farm that they grow stuff on, or there would be no forest, there would be no grassland, there would be nothing but those little individual farms. So taking some of our land and being very efficient will allow us to have other lands be untouched and untouched lands is where you get enormous biodiversity. Okay. Okay. We're out of time. Um, thanks very much. I, uh, you know, I missed a couple of questions, but you know what you, you guys will send me an email if you really need them. Thanks again uh, for your attention. I, I mentioned last week that, uh, you know, we're going to try to see if we can't send some electrons over to Alex in Nepal. Uh, I'm still thinking about that one, and we're going to post something. Travis and I are going to post something for you guys next week as a challenge for you to think about how we are going to take – I just put photovoltaic – well, I just ordered it. It'll be up on my house in the next month, and now I have to figure out how all those electrons that I saved that I'm no longer buying from the power company that come from burning natural gas or coal – how am I going to get those over to Alex in Nepal so he can distribute those at five watts per person per day? Because that means my 10,000 watts that I'm burning can help an awful lot of people. 
So we're going to think about that and we're going to challenge you guys to come up with ways uh, that you're going to help us send our electrons to Alex. That's our new campaign. All right. Thanks very much. And I will see you guys next week.